Good evening. Good evening to all my brothers and sisters online this evening. We are starting. We are live. So may God bless you. If you can hear me, just put something in the chat that you can't hear me that we are live. So, so we can make sure that I'm being heard. Amen. Hello, Pastor. Hi, Mother Lewis. How you doing? I am doing wonderfully well. The Lord is just blessing me, and I'm just grateful and thankful. Amen. Well, let's get started this evening with Walking in the Word Wednesday. Let me go to the Lord in prayer. We have a lot to be thankful for, and we have a lot to pray about. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for the miracle you did with Mother Lewis and her eye, Lord. Father, I lift up everyone who's going into surgery, Lord. I, I lift up those sick and shed in, Father. Father, I lift up Sister Inez, God. I, I lift up the members of Berean. I lift up our family members, Lord, our elected officials, Lord, those in government, those in local government, those who's watching on Facebook, those on Zoom, those who wanted to come and could not come. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking, Lord, that you move in a supernatural way tonight, Lord. There's a word from the Lord. And Lord, we got to understand this word. If we want to be prosperous, if we want to live the abundant life, God, we have to understand what the Holy Spirit has shared tonight and is sharing. So God, I thank you, Lord. Have your way this evening. Show up and show out in a supernatural way. Remind us, God, that you are still on the throne. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Walking in the Word Wednesday. Tonight. The Holy Spirit laid into my spirit, developing a biblical worldview, developing a biblical worldview. In this time, there are different worldviews, Elder Wyndham. There's a worldview and there's a biblical worldview. And tonight, we're going to understand the need to develop a biblical worldview and the blessings of having a biblical worldview. Let's talk about this evening, Dr. Barley. Let's talk about it this evening, developing a biblical worldview. Psalms 24, 1 through 10 says this, the earth is the Lord's mercy and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend it to the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart who have not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of our salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. You miss your shout this evening. Lift up, O your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up. Ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. This is a powerful scripture. It reminds us who is control of everything. Mother Lewis, you have a nice house. We have nice cars. We have nice debt. We have nice debt. But I hate to tell somebody that we are only stewards of what God has blessed us with. Come on, somebody. It don't belong to us. Amen. We are just supposed to be faithful stewards of what God has loaned us because everything belongs to God. Our houses, our cars, our children, our spouses, our, we even belong to God because God created us and he is the king of glory. So let's look at this this evening. What does it mean to have a biblical worldview? It's important, Dr. Ann. We have to understand this. Why is it important to have a biblical worldview? So what is a biblical worldview? And why is it important that we understand our worldview? What is a biblical worldview? A lot of people can't go to church Sabbath or Sabbath, Mother Lewis, but never get this point that we have to have a biblical worldview. And why is it important that we understand our worldview? Biblical or Christian worldview, here's the definition. A biblical worldview, also called a Christian worldview, is built upon the framework of ideas and beliefs through which a Christian individual group interprets the world and interacts with the world. This is a powerful concept. Our worldview shapes the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual dimensions of our lives. 
That is a powerful concept, Elder Wyndham, because we got to understand either we have a biblical worldview or a worldly worldview. And the view that we have will determine how blessed we are. It will determine how we interpret what happens in our lives. Let me give you an example. Let me bring it home. Understand, if you have a worldly, secular worldview, when something happens to you, you're probably going to, oh, why me, Lord? You know, why are you always picking on me? If God loved me, how come he let these things happen? That's a worldly worldview. But when you have a biblical world, but you understand the righteous will suffer persecutions. Trials and tribulations are going to come when you understand a biblical worldview. But the Bible says God delivers out of all of them. Amen. That's a shout. That's an amen. That's amen. So when we have this, when we don't understand our worldviews, we can be conflicted, messed up, make decisions that do not glorify God. When we do not have a biblical worldview and a secular worldview, we would do anything, listen to me, to get ahead. Oh, let the church say amen. amen. When we have a worldly, secular worldview, Oh, it's all right to step on my brother and sister to get ahead. It's all right to cry in a carpet letter and step on people and undermine people. That is a secular worldly view. But when you have a biblical worldview, when you have, when we have a biblical worldview, we understand that God will bless us and he will keep us and that God will bring increase in God's season. Amen. So let's look at this this evening. I'm trying not to get excited this evening because we got to understand everything that happens, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifference, we have to view it from a perspective. And I have Dr. Ann on the line. She's a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and she understands the way, and you all understand too, how we interpret the world will be how we, how we make our decisions. Amen. What lens are you viewing the world from? Let's look at it this evening. Watch this. Our worldview determines what is real. Our worldview determines what is real. When you have a biblical worldview, you understand the Bible is real. When you have a biblical worldview, you understand that God made the heavens and the earth. When we have a biblical worldview, we understand if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Amen. When you have a worldly, secular worldview, you believe in spiritualism occultism and all the isms that go against the word of God. You, you, you have, when we have a secular worldview, you say, well, you know, man wrote the Bible. That's right. But tell the rest of the story. When you have a secular worldview, you just stop at that one point. But when you have a biblical worldview, you understand the Holy Ghost used men to write the Bible so that we can have the word of God. Amen. The world, our worldview affects our beliefs. What is true? What is true this evening? Our worldview affects our values. What is good? Our worldview impacts our behavior. What we do. So it's important, Elder Wyndham, that we understand our worldview. Why do you do what you do? And I guarantee if you put a Christian in a room and a non-believing person in a room, you can tell the difference by their conversations. Because a Christian would understand everything that happens, God is in control. If God allows it, that settles it. The Bible says God allows the rain to rain on the just and the unjust. When we have a biblical worldview, we understand that everything works to the glory of God. When we have a biblical worldview, we know that no weapon formed against us will prosper. When we have a biblical worldview, we can say I'm protected by the word of God. I believe the word. I repeat the word. I am spreading the word of God when we have a biblical worldview. But when we have that secular corner worldview, that worldly review, oh, war is me. There's always a problem. There's murmuring, complaining, gossiping, undermining. Anything to get ahead when we have a worldly, secular worldview. And tonight, we got to make a decision tonight, my brothers and sisters, those on Facebook, those on YouTube. What is your worldview? How do you view the world? 
How do you view what you're going through? How do you view your situations? How do you view yourself? Do you view yourself through the word of God? Because when we don't have a biblical worldview, we think we all that in the bag of chips. We think we don't have sin. But the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. That's why we got to understand our worldview. We have a develop a biblical worldview. When we develop a biblical worldview, we become highly effective Christians. Oh, I like this, Elder Wyndham. When we develop a biblical worldview, we become highly effective Christians. I wish I was in church. I would say, somebody say, highly effective. When we be, amen, Mother Lewis. God is expecting us, who's on this line this evening? God is expecting us to develop, to develop. Oh, I see you, Sister Jones. I see you, Sister Braxton. I see you, Deaconess Marcy. God is expecting us tonight to develop a biblical worldview. And let me say this to you. Having your name on the road does not mean that you have a biblical worldview. Signing your name up does not mean that you have a biblical worldview. Because in order to have a biblical worldview, there's some things we got to do differently. There's some habits, some practice we have to engage in daily. So let's look at some of those practices of highly effective Christians who have a biblical worldview. Seven effective habits of Christians with a biblical worldview. Seven effective habits of Christians with a biblical worldview. This is Mike Mazzalongo. Here's what he says. Number one, first habit, effective Christians read and obey God's word. That's it. Number one, effective Christians read and obey God's word. Look what he says. Effective Christians are effective because their lives are powered by the word of God. They believe the word. They decree and declare the word. They are living epistles read of men. They believe in the power of the word of God. They know what God says and the knowledge empowers them to make right choices in more consistent ways. They resist temptation because they have God's word on their hearts and on their minds. They are more able to stand up for right, give right advice, say the right thing at the right time because they know what what right is according to to the word of God, let the church say amen. If you want to be a highly effective Christian with a biblical worldview, let's do, have it number two. Effective Christians have an active prayer life. There you go, Sister Joyce. Effective Christians have an active, not a passive, not a sometimes, not a maybe, but an active prayer life. The habit of prayer is what keeps us tuned in to God and sensitive to the spirit. Without the habit of prayer, the noise, the demands of the world, and the impulses of our flesh are all we can ever hear. The effective Christian succeeds in keeping the faith and growing in faith because he stays in touch with the spirit of God through prayer. Let the church say amen. Amen. There's power in prayer. A church that prays together stays together. A family that prays together stays together. Friends who pray together, stay together. There's power in prayer. There's miracle work in power, healing power, delivering power. That's why the Bible says pray without ceasing. Oh, Dr. Ann, I'm getting excited because I believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. If we could understand that God wants to bless us immensely when we get into our prayer closet. Number three. I got to take it deep. I need some water. God is good. Here we go. Number three, effective Christians set spiritual goals. Effective Christians set spiritual goals. Let's look at some of these goals. Effective Christianity requires that we set personal spiritual goals and actually work towards them, making the necessary sacrifices to eventually reach them. No gold medalist at the Olympics ever stood on the winner's podium without having made a decision to pursue a personal goal long before. No politician ever won an election without setting this victory as part of his or her career strategy. What is your personal goal? Yes, I'm getting personal to everybody on Zoom, everybody on YouTube, everybody on Facebook. I'm talking to you. What is your personal spiritual goal? Do you want to read the Bible more? Do you want to pray more? Do you want to fast more? Do you want to spread the gospel more? And for 2023, what is your personal spiritual goal? 
So whether it be more faithful services or starting help out in some way, a commitment to changing a bad habit for a good one or doing a better job in what we have already been given to do, we do not become more effective Christians unless we visualize a realistic goal, strategize a way of achieving it, and commit ourselves to reaching it in a certain time frame with the help of God through faith in Christ. Businesses have a goal. They call it a strategic plan. We should have a goal. We should have a strategic plan as a church. How are we going to be more effective in 2023? As individuals, we should have a, a, a strategic plan to be more impactful, more effective in 2023. Effective Christianity because that we set personal spiritual goals and actively work toward them. No way does it say, Mother Lewis, that a goal is just sitting in church, getting a sermon and going home. That's not a goal. It doesn't say a goal is, well, I'm going to go to church, get a Sabbath lunch, and go home. A spiritual goal is how can I be more spiritual, more holy, more righteous? Am, can I give more Bible studies? Can I tell more people about the love of God? Who have I invited to church? We're going to have family and friends there. I'm going to talk about that at the end of this presentation. It's going to be a powerful day. How many of you are going to invite somebody to that family and friends day? It's going to be a powerful day. And that's evangelism. God is moving in a supernatural way. And all we got to do is go out and ask people and tell them, just like the woman at the well, come see a man. Not Pastor Norwood, not the speaker of the hour, but to come and see Jesus Christ. Amen. Effective, effective habit number four. Effective Christians cultivate talents of others. Effective Christians cultivate talents of others. Effective Christians seize potential in other people and culti help them cultivate their talents. Effective Christians realize early on that in order to stay effective, they need to build up others in the body of Christ. Mercy. Amen. Amen. When's the last time we encourage somebody to write a book? When's the last time we encourage somebody to go to that cooking class? When's the last time we encourage somebody to they're, they're doing a good job? When's the last time we send a text message to Deacon Larry, you're doing a good job, or uh, Sister Wyndham, you're doing a great job as an Elder Wyndham, you're doing a great job as family ministry leader. When's the last time we encourage Mother Lewis? We need to effectively build people up. An old pastor told me this, there are only two types of people in the church. What's the two types, Pastor Noah? Those who build up the body and those who tear down. That's it. There is no in-between. And to be effective Christian, we need to build up each other in the body of Christ. Amen. Habit number five. I'm almost finished. Habit number five. This is good. Effective Christians take responsibility for souls. Effective Christians take responsibility for souls. What does it mean, Pastor Norwood? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at it. The Bereans. Ha. Huh? I said I didn't write this, but this is good. The Bereans did so to verify if Paul's preaching was accurate according to God's word. Highly effective Christians take responsibility for their own souls and the souls of others, especially the lost. Mercy. We have friends. We have family members. We have co-workers. We like them. We hang out. But all we really concerned about their souls. They are effective because they know that Christianity is not a game and faith is not a crutch for the weak. Effective Christians make a difference in their congregations and in the world because they understand that the stakes are very high and that's eternal life. And the enemy is very dangerous and that's Satan. You know, we don't talk a lot about Satan, but Satan is real. I don't know if we're afraid to talk about Satan, but the real deal is Satan is a very real being. He was kicked out of heaven. He brings division. He brings confusion. He brings sickness. He brings hatred. He brings jealousy. And as effective Christians, we got to help each other remind our family members that Satan is real and is very dangerous. Amen. And we got to make sure that we not only get into heaven, but we bring somebody else to heaven. We are told there'll be no starless crowns. Yes, we take responsibility for our souls. We say this in Louisiana. I know y'all don't say the saying in Texas, a tub guy standing on his own bottom. And we take responsibility for our own souls and the souls of others, especially the lost. Habit number six, effective Christians serve others. 
effective Christians serve others. Mm -hmm. Effective Christians have cultivated the, the character of Christ within themselves by cultivating his character a selfless service to others for their good, their advantage and their salvation. For effective Christian service is not an inconvenience they must bear in order to avoid guilt. No, like Ephrodotus, service is a way of life born out of love for Jesus. Service, I love, you know, I love Sabbath lunches. Let me, let, let me just be real about these Sabbath lunches. Amen, somebody. I love the fact how we come together. I always don't, you know, y'all don't know behind the scenes, those who are watching on Facebook, those who are watching on YouTube, I love my wife, she's over hospitality, and it's a big ordeal, making sure that we have something to eat, but I love serving people on Sabbath. If you're watching this, you all got, make sure you come April 1st. I'm gonna say more about it, and you will see what I'm talking about. We have a great time in our fellowship lunch, our Sabbath lunch, and it takes time, it takes effort, but I love serving the children of God. I love serving people. That's who I am. And that's the kind of love that we're supposed to have. Jesus had that kind of love. And if we're going to model Jesus, we're supposed to have that kind of selfless service to others for their good. Amen. Amen. Habit number seven. Effective Christians remain focused on the kingdom. Effective Christians remain focused on the kingdom of God. Highly effective Christians have learned to keep the kingdom first and have not allowed the cares and the desire for riches overwhelm their spiritual life. I got to stop right there, Mother Lewis. There's nothing wrong with having money. Let me just say that. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with, 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 with be, being so blessed that you're financially lucrative. What the problem is, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not the evil. It's the Amen. love. Uh, do you care more about money than going to church than serving others? Do you have more cares about the problems in this world than praying and preparing yourself, men and women, boys and girls, for the soon return of Jesus Christ? Highly effective Christians have learned to keep the kingdom first and have not allowed the cares and the desires for riches overwhelm their spiritual lives. When they do, they are quick to repent and refocus their attention to where it needs to be. As a matter of fact, affected Christians continue to increase their environment, their love, their very lives in the affairs of the kingdom and decrease their environment, their love, and their lives in the world. When we become effective, impactful, inspiring Christians, our focus change. God will bring the increase. God will bring the money, but we get, those, we get the blessings to be a blessing to somebody else. We should never be hardest of things God has blessed us with. Amen. Effective Christians know that the kingdom is forever, is reality, is life itself, and the world is temporary, is sinful and full of death. They know this and live accordingly. Effective Christians understand the kingdom. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The kingdom is real. Oh, hear me this evening, my brothers and sisters. The kingdom is real. And we got to stay kingdom-minded, kingdom-focused because Jesus is coming back soon. And I wanted him to say, well done, my good and faithful service. Amen. But for those people, those individuals, maybe a brother, maybe a sister, maybe a parent, maybe a cousin, maybe a church member, we do not want to hear Jesus say, depart from me for I never knew you. And if we do not become effective Christians, Jesus may say that to us. And I love y'all to death. I really do. But I, I'm working for Jesus to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. I want to be infect effective. I want to be impactful. I want to be inspiring. I want God to use me in a supernatural way. And I know God will use us in supernatural ways as we prepare for the soon return of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I want to be effective. To be a highly effective Christian, we need to develop habits of reading our Bible regularly, praying to God daily, setting personal spiritual goals, cultivating our abilities and the abilities of others, taking responsibility for your soul and the souls of other ones who are weak or lost, increase service to others, remain 
remain focused on spiritual instead of worldly things. If we are to be highly effective Christians, we got to let go of this world. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's somebody who's been struggling. You want to serve God, but you're like, well, you know, I just can't let this go. And tonight God is saying, let it go. Let go and let God watch how much God will bless you. God is looking for a church. That's a sold out church, a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, a church that love others, love the world like Jesus loved the world, like God loved the world. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't, I don't know about you, but I want that. In order to be an effective Christian, we got to believe in Jesus Christ. And once we believe in Jesus Christ, we got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You got to believe, you got to get baptized, you got to get filled with the Holy Ghost, and then you got to witness, witness of the power and the glory of God. And that's Amen. the good news. That somebody who may be a drug dealer, somebody who may be hooked on pornography, somebody who may be hooked on this, hooked on that. Tonight, God can set you free. God wants to set you free. If you just surrender your life to God. God will do it. God says, I have greater things for you. If you just let go and let God, what are you holding on to? Is it some bitterness? Is it a situation? God saying tonight, I want you to be effective, impactful. Let go and let God and let him change your life. Let him rearrange you. Let him transform you to the glory of God and watch how your life will change. It will not be easy. You may lose some friends. You may lose some family members, and that's okay because I want to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And here is the spiritual application. Where God is bringing you, others can't go. Let me say that one more time. Where God is bringing you, others can't go because they've been weighing you down. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God has greater for you. And to go higher, there are some things, some people, some situations you got to let go of so God can be a blessing to you and your family. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this word. Lord, I'll pray for my brother and sister to be effective, impactful, inspiring Christians, Lord, to be all that you called us to be in the name of Jesus. Forgive us of our sins and wash us in the blood and have your way this evening in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God. We praise you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. There is no God like you. So God, have your way. Continue to bless us and keep us is our prayer. Amen. Amen. For those on Facebook, YouTube, let's connect. www.bereansdhouston.org. www.bereansdhouston.org. Or you can call the church number 713-654-8945. 713-654-8945. Or Facebook, at Houston Berean. Instagram, at Houston Berean. Or you can tune in on YouTube. Amen. But if you want to be a blessing to the Berean Church, if you want to bless the ministry, you can mail your check or money order to P.O. Berean SDA Church, P.O. Box 1300, Houston, Texas, 77251, or 2119 Sandy Manual Street, Houston, Texas, 77003. If you want to be a, give a financial blessing and advance the kingdom of God here in the heart of Houston in the third ward, or better yet, how about you show up? Every Saturday at 10 a.m. is our Bible study. 11 o'clock is our divine, divine worship experience. Show up and let God show out. We look forward to seeing you. And I guarantee you will not be disappointed when you come into the house of the Lord. Amen. April 1st. Here we go. April 1st. You don't want to miss it. We're going to have a high day. We have our own Elder Sophie bringing the word. Then we have a musical guest, Caleb Carroll, a YouTube sensation. Caleb Carroll. He will be our musical guest. And then at afternoon at 3 p.m., we're going to have a musical extravaganza featuring Caleb Carroll. It's going to be, it's going to be great. It's going to be memorable. Then after the concert, we have our first live podcast after the concert. And there will be some good food available. You don't want to miss it. April 1st, Family and Friends Day. And once again, Elder Wyndham and Sister Wyndham do a phenomenal job with leading out in family and friends. They may God bless them and keep them it is my prayer. Amen. Amen. Let's not forget about the app. If you want to take this experience with you, 
get the app on at the app store, the Google Play, if you have an Android. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I'm so excited about this word. Let's be effective Christians. If you want more information on how to be effective Christians, just email me or come to church on a on a Saturday or we as we say in this in our in our religious environment, uh, Sabbath. We want to see you. We want to meet you. We want to be a blessing to you. And you can be a blessing to Berean. So may God bless you and keep you as my prayer. Take care. See you this Sabbath. Oh, before I forget, starting this Sabbath, this Sabbath, we start a series, sharing God's love, sharing God's love, make you happier. Starting this Sabbath, 11 o'clock, sharing God's love will make you happier. There is a book at the church. It's in the foyer. Make sure you get your book. For those who got that book, make sure you read page, chat, lesson, lesson six and lesson seven. Make sure you go over that. Lesson six and lesson seven It's in your book. And you don't want to miss, we're going to have a good time in the Lord starting this Sabbath at 11 o'clock as we're sharing God's love, make you happier. Once again, may God bless you and keep you as our prayer. Take care and be blessed. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was a correction. Lesson 16 and 17. It's lesson 16 and 17. Amen. It's in your books. Lesson 16 and 17. Amen.